All righty. We are in Galatians chapter 2, kind of. I can't remember where I stopped last time. Did I get, get all the way through chapter 1? No, not really. Not really? Okay. I kind of remember where I left off, but, you know, when I'm doing my Bible studies, it's all, it's all the same to me, man. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, I think I've gone through the whole thing. Okay. So um, we're in the book of Galatians. I already prayed for the study, so let's get to it. So um, I'm going to start down in, uh, let's start in um, verse 11 of chapter 1, just to give a real quick overview, and then we'll get into chapter 2. Uh, you know, um, Paul is writing to the Galatian church. You remember that the, the, the Galatian church is not one church, it's a whole bunch of them. So it's Derby and Lystra and Iconium and... and uh, um, uh, Pis uh, Pisidian, Antioch, and, you know, there's a whole group of churches in southern Turkey that Paul is writing to. And so this is more of a letter to a county than it is to a city, basically. Um, so when, for example, when you're uh, reading the book of 1 Corinthians, that's to the church at Corinth. And um, this is kind of a, a, a wider uh, version of uh, a letter to a group of churches. You have the same thing with uh, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, uh, well, not Third John, but and not Second John either. First John, James. <laughs> I'm just making things up as I go, you guys. <laughs> First Peter is kind of a cyclical letter to an encyclical in the sense that it goes around to different groups, and Galatians is one of those two. So um, Paul is writing to these guys because he had gone through and preached the gospel to them, and the gospel is this: that Jesus died for my sins according to the Scripture, and that He rose again the third day, according to the scripture, and that he was seen by the apostles and uh, by a number of different witnesses. And because of Jesus's death and resurrection, I am freed from my sin and I am, I am empowered to do and to live a life that the law would not allow me to live. I have a changed life because of what Jesus did. And that's the basic gospel. And, you know, we started off the afterglow with reading... Uh, uh, verses one through five uh, in chapter three, where Paul goes, you know, talks to these guys, and he goes, "You guys, um, you didn't receive the Spirit by the by the works of the law. It didn't happen that way. And miracles are not done by the works of the law. And do you really think that you're going to be made perfect by your flesh when you began in the Spirit? And so, um, uh, again, what's happening with the Galatians is that they're turning aside." from the basics of the gospel, and they're going into what we call legalism. And legalism is the idea that you can um, get your life together by rules and regulations. And that, that is something uh, that um, we're taught in the world. That is not something that we're taught in Scripture. In Scripture, we're taught that we cannot keep the law and that the only way to do it is through the power of Jesus Christ working through us. And that's really the point that Paul's making in this passage. Um, these guys who were saying this stuff were uh, what, what were called Judaizers. They were uh, uh, um, Jews who had at least by name become Christians, at least by name. Sometimes for real, they'd become Christians. And so it kind of depends on who, who Paul's talking about and in what book he's talking about it. Um, but what they were do, doing was hanging on to the Old Testament law. And in the case of the book of Galatians, they literally wanted Gentile men to get circumcised before they could become Christians. And so um, there, there's a passage in uh, Acts chapter 15 and verse 1 that we'll be talking about in, in just a few minutes. And so Paul, in uh, chapter 1 and verse 11, I know I got at least this far. He says, I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, uh, being more exceedingly jealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And so Paul, in talking about the gospel that he preached to men, um, made the point that this was something that had a divine origin. Um, it was something that would, was given to him by the revelation of Jesus. Remember, Paul got knocked off his horse on the way to Damascus to try to kill off Christians. And Jesus talked to him about the fact that he'd been kicking against the goats, 
We talked about that last week. And then he started talking to him about his, what his future was going to be and the fact that he was going to be um, sent to the Jews and to the Gentiles and that he was going to be a preacher of the gospel. He's one of those few guys who, when Jesus first saved him, told him exactly what he was going to be doing. If Jesus had told me what I was going to be doing when he first saved me, I would have said, no, thank you. <laughs> you know? And I would have left. Um, I, I like it that Jesus deals with people according to their bents, because my bent would be to not want to do any of that. And um, obviously, um, Jesus was talking to Paul, and that is exactly what Jesus did with Paul. Paul wrote three quarters of the books in the New Testament, two thirds at least of the books in the New Testament. And he was the most prolific of the, uh, of the apostles and God used this guy mightily. And um, when he went out to share the gospel, the first thing that he did was not go up to um, Jerusalem to, to get taught. The first thing that he did was he went to Jesus. You know, um, there, there have been times over the years where people have come up to me and asked me um, what Bible school I went to. Uh, you know, what, what, what seminary did you go to, Steve? What Bible school did you go to? And I always tell them, I went to the school of the Holy Spirit because I didn't go to Bible school. Never been to Bible school. You know, I, you know it's like never even took a class in Bible school. Um, when I uh, was thinking about going to Bible school, uh, my father-in-law, you know, actually my father-in-law, oh, you know, I don't know if I want to tell that story. That's, yeah, it was too late by that time. He said, Steve, you've been reading your Bible too long. You know, you don't need that. So anyway, and it was a lot of money and I didn't have it. And so um, in any case, uh, the stuff that I know, you guys, is stuff that I learned by sitting down with my Bible and the Lord and asking him to teach me. And, and when I started, I didn't know anything at all. Now, obviously, I was going to church. And so I, I went to churches. Well, I went to a church uh, where the Bible was taught, and it was taught clearly, and it was and and it was a real good thing. It, it kept me rooted and grounded in, in what the truth was, and um, it good, gave me a really good um, attitude towards myself. There were there were a couple other things that were going on uh, during that period of time where God was doing a lot of humbling in my life, um, but I've always had the attitude that I want to hear from Jesus, and I want Him to be the one who teaches me. But I also know that I can I can be a real doofus. And I can come up with things that are just flat out dumb. And so one of the things that's, that's happened over the years is Jesus has done exactly that with me. I'll, I'll be going through passages and God will show me how all, thing, all, all this stuff hooks together and, and that kind of thing. And you know how I am. And most of that has been stuff that Jesus has just shown me over the years. Um, there have been those times when I thought I found something new. And any time that I, I think I find something new, I start getting nervous because if I'm the only guy who knows it, that's a little silly. Because God's been speaking to um, men and women for the last 2,000 years in Christianity. And for another 1,500 years before that, um, from the time of Moses, and better men and women than me. And so there's a real good chance I'm never coming up with something new, right? And so one of the things that um, I've done is when I'm going through a passage and I see something and I'm like, wow, this is cool. This goes with this, this goes with that, and you know, that kind of stuff. I've never heard this before. I'll, I'll go hit the commentaries and see if somebody else has found it too. And usually, actually every single time, not usually, every single time that I've hit the commentaries, um, one of the guys that I respect will have been spoken, you know, God will have spoken that to him and he's written it down sometimes 400 years ago. You know, that kind of thing. Um, actually, one of my favorite commentators is Matthew Henry. He wrote in the 1700s. And uh, really good, really good. And there's, there have been times when, you know, God showed me something about some issue. And I've gone through more of the, some of the modern commentaries. And not a word about it. Not even dealing with the issue that, I, that I'm thinking about. Go back to Matthew Henry and that dude is all over it. You know, and, and so you have that kind of stuff. And so all the, all the stuff that I've got, all the stuff that I give you, I got it straight from Jesus. And I'm not saying that I don't use commentaries because I do. I use commentaries too, but um, I've always used them sparingly. And so usually what, I, what I'm doing is I'm sitting down with the Lord 
and I'm going through a passage, like uh, we're going through the book of Galatians. I sit down, go through the book of Galatians. I outline it on my own. I ask God to speak to me about, uh, about different issues and, and that kind of stuff. And then after um, I've got a good idea of what I feel like the Lord wants me to say, then I'll go hit the commentaries and see if there's anything good in there. And, and it's not that I don't use those things, because a lot of times I will. Um, but um, I don't depend on commentaries. Because a commentary, you know, again, it's not something that, that I despise, but it is something that we need to keep in mind that it's just another man's opinion. You know that about when you come to church here, right? That you need to be checking out everything that I say. It needs to be going along with the word. And if it goes along with the word, then great. And if it doesn't go along with the, with the word, then that's something um, that you need to watch out for. Um, I, most times when I'm uh, giving an opinion on some issue, I'll let you know this is just my opinion on the whole thing. And I'll, I'll tell you, this isn't in the Bible, but this is what I think is going on here. And again, you, you need to uh, keep that in mind. But Paul, when he got saved, the first thing that he did was went to the Jesus Christ School of the Bible. And he just sat down with the Lord. And that is exactly what every single one of us should be doing. You need to, you, you, um, um, obviously we as believers need to be going to church. The Bible flat out says that we need to, and it's a commandment. Okay. And so you're going to get things from the Bible studies that are here, but you're not going to get the best stuff from here. You're going to get the best stuff when you're alone with the Lord. All the stuff that, that, I, that I remember the best, all the questions that, um, uh, that I've had answers. You know, a lot of times people will ask me questions and um, lots of times people will say, wow, you know, it's like you have this encyclopedic brain and you remember everything and you know where every passage is and that kind of stuff. You know what that is? I just had the same questions. And all the stuff that I got from Jesus sticks. That's what it is. There, there's stuff that I've looked up in a commentary somewhere. There, there are issues that I've looked up in commentaries and I just can't remember them. And I'll have to go back again and again. What was that? What was that that the guy said? It was so good. And I'll have to go back again and again and again to get that stuff. And I'll go, oh, yeah. And, you know, sometimes I'll write it in my Bible. Sometimes I'll forget, so I forget it again. But all the stuff that Jesus has showed me, it sticks. It sticks. And that's why it's so cool to go and, and sit down with the Lord and ask him about this stuff. He's going to be the best teacher you ever have. So you, you go and sit down with Jesus. That's exactly, again, what Paul did. Um, he talks about his familiarity with the, with the Jewish law. He says in verse 12, I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly ze ze zealous um, for the traditions of my fathers. And what he's saying is, um, you guys are following Judaizers. You guys are following people who say that they know Judaism. You want to know somebody who knows Judaism? I know Judaism. He was, he was under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was one of, the, uh, one of the most famous rabbis in all of Jewish history. And Paul was his student. Paul was um, the up-and-coming rabbi in Jerusalem. Most likely, he was going to end up on the Sanhedrin. Um, but he had a little appointment with Jesus that kind of detoured him off that you know, career track. And so Paul knows what Judaism is all about. And um, as a matter of fact, um, he knows Judaism better than these guys do. And he's more zealous than these guys ever were um, because he was a guy who went out to literally destroy the church. He thought he was doing God's work by killing off Christians because they were not keeping Judaism. That's what his deal was. They were not keeping Judaism. And so the same things that these false teachers are telling to the Galatians, Paul is saying, that's what I used to be, and I used to be way more rowdy about it than these guys are. And again, you need to keep that in mind. And so um, it's, it, it's something also to keep in mind when somebody comes up to you and starts trying to pass off the, the keeping of the Old Testament law as something that Christians need to do. Okay, and so this is what I mean by that. I don't mean that you just take the Old Testament and you toss it out. You know that. You know I don't think that. Because um, the Old Testament is just full of, of uh, just rich teaching, rich stories. Some of the best stuff that you're ever going to read in the Bible, you're going to get out of the Old Testament. In fact, the, the New Testament is three quarters Old Testament any, anyway. It's just quoting from the Old Testament. So you don't just toss the Old Testament. 
But there's a difference between looking at the, um, the uh, moral code of the Old Testament and recognizing that it's righteousness and taking it, you know, going into Judaism and deciding that you must, for example, keep the food laws. There are things that we know out of the Old Testament that have been fulfilled in Christ. So the first thing that we know that has been fulfilled in Christ is sacrifice. Sacrifices have been fulfilled in Christ. That's why God took away the temple and we don't need to sacrifice anymore because we have a sacrifice. The Sabbath has been fulfilled in Christ. The Sabbath was all about rest and don't light your own fire. And in the same way, Jesus is all about rest. I rest in Christ. As soon as I become a Christian, what happens is I stop doing my own works and Jesus begins working through me. That's what the Sabbath was all about. I am to rest in the Lord. Then lighting your own fire. A lot of times what people want to do is they want to have a, a deep emotional experience with God every single time that they show up. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with emotional experiences. We are emotional beings. God made us that way. But that is not what I'm supposed to be looking to. And I'm not supposed to be drumming up an emotional experience that replaces the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And you know, let me tell you something about the power of the Holy Spirit too. Um, the first time I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I felt nothing. I felt nothing. I, you know, I, I went forward. Uh, a guy named, um, oh, was it? It was Bob Coy. It wasn't Bob Coy, the preacher. It was another Bob Coy. Anyway, I went. I went forward. This guy was a was a Maranatha artist. Um, he was a um, he was a, uh, a piano player, and he came to our church and just a really good singer. And he, you know, uh, basically called me out during the during the uh, time that he was doing worship. And um, I came up and I got prayed for. And one of the first things he asked me was, "Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit?" And I said, "I don't know." I'm a new, you know, I was a new Christian. I had no idea. And he goes, well, let me pray for you. And so he did. And he prayed for me and I sat there and I was like, I was expecting something to happen like when I got saved. Because when I got saved, it was like waves of, you know, whatever from heaven, you know, going, going through my body. You know, it was like, it was like just a radical rush is what happened when I got saved. Well, I expected the same thing when I got filled with the Holy Spirit and nothing. And so I'm, I'm standing there, and on the one hand, I want to have faith. On the other hand, I'm, 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 I'm like, well, maybe this guy's prayer didn't work. Maybe I'm not good enough. You know, all this stuff is going through my head, and I didn't notice any difference until I got out of there. And what happened after I got out of there was my next week was awesome. It was awesome. All the things that I was failing at, the reasons that I went forward to get prayed for, all the stuff that was going on in my life that, that I was just blowing big time, it's, it's like I had total power over it. I had total victory over it for that week. And then Steve went back right back to where he was before. And uh, it was the power of the Holy Spirit. And what I didn't realize at that time was that I should be praying for that all the time. I didn't understand it at that point. In any case, you don't, you don't go after emotional experiences. What you go after is the power of God. What you go after is a trust in the Lord and a recognition that he's going to be the one who does the changing. He's the one who does the changing. And so, again, well, we need to keep that in mind. Um, when, you, when you look at what he says at the end here, <clears throat> he says... Um, uh, verse 17, it says, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me again, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and re remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And that's talking about literally James, Jesus's brother. Uh, the Bible talks about the fact that Mary didn't know her husband, Joseph, until after Jesus was born. That word no in Greek, it's, it's like the biblical no. It's the idea of she didn't have physical relations with him until after Jesus was born. And then she was a normal wife. If she hadn't have been a normal wife, if she had withheld from her husband, she would, been, would have been violating scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says that when you're married to somebody, your body is not your own. And so if you're a wife, your body is your husband's. If you're a husband, your, your body is your wife's. And you are not your own. And so you're not to withhold from one another. And so if Mary had withheld from her husband Joseph, she would have been in sin. And the Bible talks about in a number of passages. And uh, for example, in Matthew chapter 
13, it talks about the fact that Jesus had brothers and he had sisters. And so um, there's a passage in, in uh, Matthew 13 where, um, oh, is it Matthew 13? Yeah, I think it is. Um, where uh, the people in Nazareth say, talk about Jesus' brothers. James, we got their names. James and Joses and Simon and Judas. James wrote the book of James and Judas is Jude. And so he wrote the book of Jude. And are his sister and his sisters, are they not with us? And the sisters aren't named, but there's at least two of them. And so after uh, um, Jesus um, ascended, one of the guys that he, or actually, actually after he rose from the dead, one of the guys that he appeared to is James, this guy, his brother. And it was at that point, it looks like, that James finally began following Jesus. Um, when you look at these guys in the Gospels, they're always tagging along trying to find Jesus and trying to take him home. My crazy big brother thinks he's the Messiah. My crazy big brother thinks he's God come in human flesh. Come home, Jesus, come home. You know, it's that kind of thing. And they even had Mary with him at, at one point. In any case, James becomes the leader at the church in Jerusalem. It wasn't Peter. It was James. And so you see him standing out front uh, in, that, in that situation. And so Paul talks about the fact that he saw Peter and that he saw James uh, when he went to Jerusalem. Now concerning the things which I write to you before, indeed before God, I do not lie. After I word, afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Syria is what we call Syria nowadays, and Cilicia is in southern Turkey. And he says, I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they were hearing only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. And so Paul talks about the fact uh, that um, his gospel was confirmed even before he had conversations, before he had specific um, uh, presentation of his gospel to the apostles, um, his ministry was confirmed by the churches in Judea. They were all um, glorifying God on the, uh, uh, because of the fact that Paul um, was a guy who had turned and turned radically. It's always good when you have uh, people who turn and turn radically because that's what it's supposed to look like. It's not supposed to be this thing where, you know, I'm, I'm this filthy, rotten, dirty, you know, heathen, and then I come to Jesus and I'm still a filthy, rotten, d dirty heathen for the next 15 years or something. There needs to be a radical change that takes place in our life. Now, some of you guys, when you got saved, you were sweet in the first place, man. <laughs> you were just nice people. Um, but most of the people I know who got saved, they were not nice people before they got saved. And you could see the difference. You know, there was a, this is one of my favorite you know, illustrations. Back in the 70s, there was this, this commercial and it was, it was about this, this margarine. And um, uh, I think it was, it. I can't believe it's not butter. I can't remember if it was that one. This guy, it, it had this French guy. And so he's like this French chef and he takes the butter and he puts it on a croissant or whatever he's going to, yeah. And he takes the margarine, he puts it on the, on, on the other one and he takes a bite of the butter and then he takes a bite of the, of the, the one with the margarine on it and he goes, no difference. No difference. Some people who say that they're following Jesus, that's what you could say about them. There's no difference. They're exactly the same as they were before they said that they started following Jesus. And that is not the way that it's supposed to be. There's supposed to be a difference. There's supposed to be a change that takes place in our lives. That's what we need to be looking for um, in our walks with God. And so Paul, again, um, has his ministry confirmed by the church's in, in Judea, they were glorifying God because of him. When you get to chapter 2, chapter 2 is the uh, continuation of Paul's defense. And that's, what, that's one of the things that you have at the very beginning of the book of Galatians is him defending his ministry. Because every time that um, one of these groups of Judaizers would come in after him, he would basically come in, he'd break the ground, and lots of people would get saved. He'd set up a church, and then he'd move on to the next one. Sometimes he stayed for a few weeks. Sometimes he stayed for a couple of years um, in uh, Corinth. Actually, one of the most messed up churches, Paul stayed there for two years. And, you know, when I, uh, I went to Corinth uh, not, too, not too long ago, probably about five or six years ago, 
um, we did uh, kind of an apostles tour and we went around the Mediterranean. And one of the places that we hit was Corinth. And what, what's cool about this place is it's on this isthmus between uh, what we call Sparta and what we call the rest of, the rest of Greece. And there's a canal that went right through the middle of it. And Corinth is right near that canal. Um, that was built way back, way back when. In any case, um, they, would, they would take their ships and they would bring it up to this isthmus and then they would drag them across this isthmus to the other side to, to get from the Aegean to the, uh, between the Balkans and Italy is, I can't remember, it starts with an A. Adriatic, thank you, the Adriatic. And so they dragged their ships across and Corinth was sitting right there. In fact, it was kind of the, um, the seat of power in, uh, in uh, Greece at the time. And so we get there. And you're sitting on, uh, at Corinth, it's just below a hill, and it's kind of on a plateau area down, looking over, overlooking this isthmus. And off to the right, you can see the Aegean, and off to the left, you can see the Adriatic. And it's just a beautiful spot. And it's like, it, the weather's like Southern California. And so, beautiful spot, ocean view, no matter where you look, that kind of stuff. And I, I was standing there, and I was like, oh, this is why he stayed for two years. <laughs> this is a nice spot, man. But probably the reason he stayed for two years is because they were a mess and um, he, was, he was ministering to them. In any case, what would happen is he'd come into a place and he'd share the gospel with these people, start a church, then he'd move on and then the, then the infiltrators would come in. And the first thing that they would do is they would start undermining Paul's authority. They would start talking about the fact that he's not an apostle, like Peter is an apostle. And sometimes they would pop off with the idea that um, Peter had, um, uh, had instituted their ministry and that he was backing them and that he wasn't backing Paul. And there was all this nonsense that was going on. And so in a couple of the letters that you read, Paul's going through going, guys, this is, what my, this is where my ministry comes from. This is what it's all about. And you need to know that Jesus called me to be an apostle. I'm not a phony. These other guys are. And he would, he would make those points and he would make them in no uncertain terms. He says, verse 1 in chapter 2, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And so he's going on with his history, and he talks about the fact that after 14 years of ministry, um, he went up to Jerusalem, to, uh, and again with Barnabas, uh, to have his gospel confirmed. There were five trips that Paul made uh, to Jerusalem, according to the book of Acts. Um, there may have been others, um, but these are the ones that are recorded. The first one is in Acts 9.26, and, and that's not too long after he got saved. And then um, there is a famine visit um, in Acts 11.27, um, where Paul and Barnabas specifically went down uh, to take money that was collected to relieve a famine in Jerusalem. Then in Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas um, also go down to Jerusalem. And there's a council at Jerusalem, and that council is all about whether or not Gentiles should be circumcised. Um, then uh, there's a couple others uh, in his second missionary journey, he went in uh, um, Acts 18.22, and then there was a final visit in Acts chapter 21, verses 15 through 23. And so all that stuff's up there. You can, you can check it out if you'd like to. Um, the visit that he's probably talking about here is the second one, um, where he and Barnabas came down uh, because of a famine. And the reason I say that it's most likely the second one, um, there's a lot of commentators who will say, well, it was probably the Jerusalem Council one. If it had been the Jerusalem Council, um, basically, again, what was happening was um, there were people who were teaching that the, Jew that the Gentiles needed to keep the law. Specifically, they needed to be circumcised and keep the commandments. And um, the, uh, the output of that council, what they came up with was a cyclical letter and it's called an encyclical where they would go around to the churches with this letter saying, no, the Jews don't have to keep uh, the law no, or the Gentiles don't have to keep the law and no, they don't need to be circumcised specifically. And if that had been the case, that's what Paul would have pulled out in this situation. Um, he wouldn't have to go through, you know, through all this rigmarole talking about um, his 
um, authority and that kind of stuff. He would have just whipped out that letter and said, haven't you heard of the Jerusalem Council? These guys are off the wall. Here's why. Here's the letter. And so obviously this has taken place before that. One of the points that he makes was um, that when he went to Jerusalem, it wasn't because he was called on the carpet. Um, he went as a result of a revelation. In other words, God directed him to go down to Jerusalem. He wasn't summoned. And again, probably uh, the time that he did that uh, was during uh, the Jerusalem famine. There's a, 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 ver a passage in Acts chapter 11 that says this, in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. You gotta remember, Jerusalem is on, it's, it's down in Israel, and Antioch is up here in Syria, and this is the Mediterranean, basically. So Jerusalem, Antioch, they go up there, okay? So these prophets come from Jerusalem to Antioch, Agabus is among them, and he stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. That's the thing about prophecy. When God gives a prophecy, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, it always comes to pass. If somebody's given a prophecy and it doesn't happen, it's a false prophecy. And again, it doesn't matter if you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament. And so Agabus is a New Testament prophet. He didn't have an 80% success rate. It was 100%. Success rate. And so um, I've heard of Christians talking about their success rates with prophecy. There is no success rate with a prophecy other than 100%. Otherwise, it's just you, you yapping. And if it's from God, God always knows the future. And that's what he did with Agabus. He showed that this was going to take place. And the reason that he showed it was going to take place, it's a bad thing that's going to happen, right? And the reason that God showed Agabus that this was, this was going to happen was so that the churches who had much would be able to put aside some so that they could take care of the churches that have little. That was the point behind it. And that's one of the things that you'll see with biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy is not pointless. You know, um, one of the things that you, you need to recognize about the, the whole issue of the spiritual gifts is you have real biblical spiritual gifts and then you have satanic counterfeits. And in the area of prophecy, this is what I've seen, and this is experience um, over the years, but in the area of prophecy, um, there have been people who have told me, well, they've always been able to know the future beforehand and from the time that they were a little kid, and they were Christians. And then they become Christians and they think, well, maybe this is, a, you know, this is the gift of prophecy and God just gave it to me before I was a Christian. Wrong, it doesn't work that way. Um, nobody who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus has the power of the Spirit taking place in their life. Jesus made that really clear in John chapter 14. He said, he said that those in the world do not receive the Spirit for they neither see him nor know him. And so you can't have spiritual gifts taking place before you're even saved. It doesn't work that way. Spiritual gifts play, take place after you're saved. And I've had some people who've had situations like that where they felt like um, they were predicting the future um, and almost, uh, I, I can't think of a time where it wasn't some calamity. I can't think of a time where it wasn't something like a plane wreck or somebody died or you know somebody was gonna die or a train wreck or things like that. It was, it's almost, in, in my experience, it's almost always been like that. Literally stuff that you cannot do anything about. You cannot do anything about. That is not what biblical prophecy is about. Biblical prophecy, if God's going to tell you something that's coming, he's telling you for a reason. And the reason may be so that you can go and give a warning to people. You have that in the Old Testament. God told these guys in the Old Testament, I'm coming uh, and I'm going to take out your city. I'm going to use the Babylonians to do it and you need to repent. He told guys, I'm coming, I'm gonna take out your city, and I'm gonna use the Assyrians to do it. You need to repent. Um, with Joseph, um, he, um, he specifically gave a dream to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh didn't know what the dream was about. And Joseph, again, through the power of the Spirit, was given the interpretation. Joseph goes through and tells them what the interpretation is. And the interpretation is there's going to be seven years of plenty. We're going to have bumper crops. But then after that, there's going to be seven years of famine that eat up everything that we made during the seven years of plenty. 
And so you need to appoint somebody over this matter and make sure that we're saving up food, basically. And so the Pharaoh went, who better than you? And picked Joseph, and that's exactly what Joseph did. And so again, when you see prophecy going forth and the, the um, gifts of the Spirit being used, um, you see them in the context of God wants to help people. And that's what's happening with Agabus in that passage. Paul came up, and uh, when he went to Jerusalem with the offering of food, um, one of the things that he did was he made sure that he communicated the gospel to the apostles there. I went up by revelation, he says, communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. And what you see there is a willingness for Paul to bow to authority. You have a, a willingness um, of Paul to make sure that he covers himself so that he doesn't give offense. He's not a guy who just goes out, even though he's talking about the fact that Jesus is the one who has spoken to him. He's not a guy who just goes out and says, well, Jesus has spoken to me, and so you can take whatever you think and you can stuff it. He's not a guy who's like that. I don't care if you agree with what I say. I don't care if um, you think that what I'm doing is unbiblical, Peter. I don't care if you think that what, I, what I'm doing is against the scripture, James. I don't care. And you don't see him doing that. And so even though um, he talks about the fact that these guys are not something that we need to be necessarily looking up to in the, in the, with the idea of putting them on a pedestal, he does understand how authority works. And he does understand that um, he needs to have somebody that he's accountable to. It's always good to keep that in mind. Who are we accountable to? Jesus, number one. But who else are we accountable to? Everybody else. Everybody else. We're all accountable. And so um, one of the things that, that we need to keep in mind is that there are going to be times when um, you may not be listening up and God may use somebody to speak to you about something. And so um, humility is a good thing. Um, humility, actually humility on both sides of that issue is a good thing. I very rarely, very, very rarely just walk up to somebody and start telling them what's up. And the reason is because who do I think I am? And so if I'm going to do something like that, I need to really have the leading of God uh, in a situation. Now, you know, there, there are situations where um, God's just put me in a, in a position of authority. And again, in church, it's like that. But even with that, um, if, if I come up to you and I say, hey, God's been speaking to me about you and some of the things that you're doing. Uh, let's have a talk. You can know that I've been praying about that for probably a couple of weeks, at least, before I come up and do it. It's, a, it's not going to just be something that I just pop off with. And so, um, it, again, it's something to keep in mind. I have seen some of the most arrogant people in my life in church. Just ridiculously arrogant. Coming up and... and and judging and having an attitude towards people that they know nothing about and popping off with their big fat mouth trying to tell somebody who um, actually God is using in ways that is just ridiculously above anything that's going on in their life, trying to tell them how to run their ministry. And what I'm talking about is Greg Laurie. I, you know, I was, I, I was, uh, I went to Greg Laurie's church and for a period of time I was kind of Greg Laurie's, I wasn't his, his, bodyguard, but that's kind of what he used me for. Um, he, would, he would be there after services, and you cannot believe the crazy people that there are in Southern California. There, there's nutso people down there, man. And um, so I've, you know, I've been a, a big guy ever since high school, and so Greg would have me come up, and I'd just stand next to him. I, you know, I didn't have to do a lot, but you know, if somebody was going to get weird on him, then you know, there was a possibility I was going to have to stop him, because people literally you know, would attack the guy. And so um, I might have to escort them out, out the door. It's always fun to be a, you know, a bouncer for Jesus. That's a, that's a, what a great job, right? You know, and so never had to do it. But this one time, man, this dude comes walking up to Greg and, and uh, there, there had been a line of people. I would, you know, I, he would stay um, after services for a good long time. And um, I'm, I'm standing there. There's a whole line of people asking him questions and uh, wanting things from him and, and that kind of stuff. And this one last dude comes walking up and um, he goes, I need to talk to you. And, and, and uh, 
there were a couple other people, and Greg goes, you know what, I got to go. Um, I, I promised my wife some stuff, I got to get out of here, and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. And he, and he was like, I'm really sorry. If you can come back to the next service, I'll be glad to talk to you. And the guy was just insistent. No, you can't go. You can't go. I need to talk to you. And, you know, and finally, Greg goes, okay, fine. What do you want to talk to me about? And he goes, well, God's just been speaking to me. And every time that somebody would say that to Greg, this is what he'd do. He'd look at him. He'd, he'd be standing there kind of like this. And the guy would go, God's been speaking to me. And sometimes they'd say, God's been speaking to me about you. And what he'd do is he'd just kind of do this. He'd take a step back. Because usually it was going to get weird. So, and that's exactly what happened in this situation. And so the guy goes, God's been speaking to me. And Greg goes, okay, what's God said to you? Well, um, he said a couple of things about Greg's ministry that I was just like, you little punk. Who are you? You know, really the gall to come up and talk to this guy and start spouting off to him about things that you know nothing about. And so he'd said a couple of things about Greg's ministry where he could improve it. You know, great, you could improve in these areas. I'm like, you, <laughs> what is wrong with you? And so I'm praying for the guy because even though I think people are punks, I still pray for him. And so I'm praying for the guy. And then the guy goes, and the other thing that God told me is that you need to buy me a car. <laughs> and it wasn't any car. It was a certain kind of Mercedes that Greg needed to buy for him. And Greg goes, you know what? Conversation's over. And the, and um, he turns around to go, and the guy, you know, starts to reach out to grab him, and I just kind of step up and go, you know, Greg's got to go. And the guy was like, and takes off and stuff like that. Crazy people. And I would see guys like that all the time who would come up, and ladies would come up and, and start spouting off to, you know. And, I, you know, I put Greg on a, on a pedestal, but, you know, the guy's, the guy's sharp. I, you know, I've, 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 I was involved in his ministry for years, I, you know, I continue to pay attention to what's going on down there. I know guys who are on his board and that kind of stuff. He loves the Lord. And, um, you know, he's, he keeps things together in, in, in any case. And so um, you got to watch it when you're walking up to somebody and you're going to tell them what to do with their life. How's your life going before you start talking to somebody about their life? You know, that's that whole thing in your eye. You got a beam in your eye. You're walking up and talking to, about somebody's um, spec. And so keep that in mind. But then on the other hand, you need to be open to the things that people have to say to you. And so both those things, you know, it needs to be humility both ways. And so uh, Paul is a guy who has some humility. And so he, he goes down to, uh, again, Jerusalem. And um, in the passage, it goes on and says, um, verse three, yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And so you have Titus, who is a uh, companion of Paul, and he's a test case on this whole thing with what do Gentiles need to do. Um, so he lets him know he wasn't compelled to be circumcised. Verse 4, and he says, And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. And so it wasn't a situation where Titus was just, you know, it was like, you know, no, no problem, you don't need to be circumcised. Obviously, the apostles were saying that. There's no reason for Titus to be, a, to be circumcised. Um, but there were people in the church at Jerusalem who Paul says were false brethren. They're fakes. And so they're going to church, pretending to be Christians, and all they are is Christians on the outside. But one of the things that you find with people who are just Christians on the outside, saying the right things and pretending to do the right things and just being an actor, a hypocrite. Hypocrite is an actor in Greek. Um, being an actor is that sooner or later, everything starts coming out because Jesus said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is gonna speak. You're gonna start saying things that reflect your heart. And that's what happened with these guys also. And so they were trying to compel um, Titus to be circumcised, but he wasn't. Um, just to let you know that Paul did not have this ultimate um, attitude towards circumcision, there's another case of a guy that went around with Paul. And you know, Titus is the guy that Paul wrote the letter of Titus, the pastoral epistle of Titus to. 
There's another guy that Paul wrote two pastoral epistles to, and it's Timothy. First and second Timothy are written to this guy. Now, Titus was a Greek. And so Greek mom, Greek, Greek dad, right? But Timothy was a guy who had a Gentile dad, a Greek dad, and a Jewish mom. Okay, now, this is, a, this is kind of a different case. And the reason it's a different case is because a guy who is um, born into a family with a Jewish mom and a Gentile dad, he's Jewish. A guy who is born, or a lady, who is born into a family with a Gentile mom and a Jewish dad, if they want to become Jewish, they have to be converted because they're not considered Jewish. The, the Bible, uh, or the Jews, consider that the, that the body comes through the mom and not through the dad. And so if you're, if you're born of a Jewish mom, you're Jewish. If you're born of a Jewish dad, you're not. You're a Gentile. Okay? And so Timothy's a Jewish guy. And what Paul is going to do is he's going to go around to um, all of these, these um, cities, and the first place that he always went was to the synagogue. And so um, when uh, Timothy was going to uh, be involved with the ministry of Paul, Paul asked him to get circumcised. And the reason was so that he wouldn't offend the Jews because he was going to go and preach to the Jews. It's in uh, Acts 16, verses 1 through 3. It says this, Then he came to Derbe and Lystra. These are some of the same churches that Galatians is written to. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And so um, Paul, in reaching out to the Jews, um, didn't have a problem taking and, and dealing with stuff that the Jews would be offended by. In other words, um, Paul is going to have Timothy come with him. They're going to go preach the gospel to the Jews. And what's got to happen if you're going to go preach the gospel to a group of people, if you've got stuff in your life that they find offensive on the face of it, you need to get rid of it so they don't have something to focus on, right? And so I have been in churches where they dress nice. Um, we don't dress nice in our church. <laughs> we dress, you guys dress nice. You look good. <laughs> okay. But I've been in churches where, where I knew that if I, if I went there and I wasn't dressed up, it would be something that people would be focusing on. And so dress up. Um, I've had situations, you know, when, when, uh, uh, when I do funerals, um, when I do weddings, I've had people say to me, um, I don't want you to dress up at the wedding. And you know what? I don't care at a wedding because they're not the only ones there. And so what's going to happen is they're going to have family members and I'm supposed to be the pastor and here, here I am, if I know that they've got all kinds of family members, and I'm, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to share the gospel with people. And if all they can see is that um, there's the pastor dressed in Levi's in a t-shirt, and obviously he doesn't respect the bride and groom enough to dress up for their wedding, that's what they're going to be thinking about, and they're not going to be thinking about the gospel. And so I, I wear a suit when I'm doing funerals, and I wear a suit when I'm doing uh, weddings. Um, I have worn a suit and gone barefoot because the bride told me to. Otherwise, I'll do exactly what the bride tells me to. I'll even, I'll even wear whatever color shirt she wants, whatever co color tie she wants. I'll, I, I'll match with her. She can dress me up like a doll. I don't care. But, um, you know, it's like I don't want to do things that get in the way of sharing the gospel. If I was going to go share the gospel with um, in, a, in a place that was Seventh-day Adventist, I would not be eating steak in front of the Adventists. I would not be doing that. If, I was, if I'm going to share the gospel in India, same thing. There are things that are offensive to people that need to be taken care of so that you can share the gospel. And that's all that, that Paul was doing with Timothy. And so Paul was the one who circumcised Timothy. You guys know what circumcision is, right? So I'm not going to explain that to you. That is, you know, a close buddy right there. <laughs> in any case, Titus is a Greek, and he, he has no Jewish blood in him. He goes down with Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, and he was not compelled to be circumcised. He was pressured by the Judaizers. And again, this is before Acts chapter 15, 
And in Acts chapter 15, one of the things that the Judaizers did um, in talking about Paul and Barnabas's ministry um, was they uh, specifically came down to Antioch and it says certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Which was against everything that God had showed them up to that point. There was a point in uh, in the book of Acts where um, the uh, Jews who'd be, who had become Christians, they, um, they all basically had this prejudice against Gentiles, and rightly so in most cases. Because in a lot of Gentile religions, they're literally having sex for God. And they're really, literally butchering babies for God, uh, for their gods. Um, you know, when, you, when you're talking about the pagan world, um, m- many of the gods in the pagan world were just representations of um, people's lust. And so, um, you know, of, of human attributes. And so if you were a guy who had a temper that was out of whack, and you were always violent. Your God would be Ares, the God of war. And if you were somebody who just felt like you wanted to sleep around, you could call it worship of Aphrodite or worship of Venus, and you know, and so on and so forth. You can go, you can go through the whole list of of Roman and Greek gods, and that's what these these guys were into. And so the Jews would look at that and they'd just go, "That's disgusting." And so they had some reason to have an attitude towards the Gentiles, but they, they literally were shocked when Gentiles got saved. They were shocked. And so in Acts chapter 10, Peter goes down um, at, because of a revelation from God. He goes down to um, the city of Caesarea and he goes to um, a uh, household of a Jewish soldier and that guy invites, or excuse me, a Gentile sh- soldier, a Roman soldier, and he invites all his friends and they're all Gentiles. And before Peter can even get done, before he can even get to the invitation at the end, all these people start speaking in tongues and prophesying and stuff like that. And it's obvious that the Holy Spirit had been poured out on these guys. And Peter looks at the, the Jewish guys who were with him and he, and he says, who can deny that these guys should get baptized? They just had got the same gifts of the Spirit that we got. They're obviously saved. And everybody's like, yeah, who would have thunk it? God saves Gentiles. You know, and and that that happened with Peter, and so um, this whole thing that was taking place was after that event. And you still have Jews who are saying that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's silliness. So I got to go and cut a piece of skin off before Jesus can save me. What if I'm not around a knife? What if I've, I've got nobody to do it for me? And why does it just got to be me? Why doesn't it have, you know, a, that's a guy thing. And there's a reason for it in the Old Testament. There's a picture of cutting away the flesh. The reason that circumcision was focused on that area of the, of the human anatomy is because, again, of the, of the um, sexual immorality that was involved in paganism. It was a picture of the fact that this is not what you do with your body. You cut this away. You don't join in with them. You cut it away. And that's um, actually the word Gilgal. That's literally what it means. It means rolling away of the flesh. And that's where the um, Jews, uh, before they went into the land of, of Canaan, were circumcised. And so they try to take that and bring it into New Testament times and say that, you know, we can preach the gospel to you, but it's not going to work until you get circumcised. Right? Anybody else do things like that? You can't be saved unless you're baptized. So unless I get dunked in water, I can't go to heaven. Really? Thief on the cross? Jesus sitting there? Thief on the cross says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom? And he says, oh, I wish you'd said that to me the day before yesterday. Because if you had just come up to me the day before yesterday, we could have baptized you. You would have got into heaven. You know, that kind of thing. He's sitting there on the cross. Mm, I hate it when that happens. You know, John, can you get some water, throw it on this dude? You know, that is not what happened. What he, what he did was he turned to him and he said, verily, verily. It means, um, it's, it's literally in Greek, amen, amen. Amen, amen. So be it, so be it. Truly, truly, I say to you. 
today you will be with me in paradise. Just because he asked to be remembered. And there was nothing else that that, that guy could do. He is literally like this, sitting on a cross. Nothing he can do. And the guy goes to heaven. He's a great picture of what it means to be saved by grace. Because that's, that's exactly what it is. Nothing gets added to it. And so, again, we need to keep that in mind. Paul says these guys are infiltrators. In verse 4, he says that they were secretly brought in. Um, brought in by who? Or whom? Who brought them in? And one, again, one of the things that we need to understand is that when Satan is opposing the church, in the book of Acts, what he did was he started out persecuting the church. And if he couldn't beat them by persecution, what he did was he tried to join them. And that's what you have with Judaizers. Guys who aren't saved, trying to join up. Trying to, trying to mold the church, mold the, the people of God into their image of what they think it should be. And what Satan was trying to do was put these guys back under the law. Now, again, I've been talking about the law again. Let me, let me again um, put you in the right perspective on this stuff. When God said, um, you're not to murder, has he changed his mind on this thing? When he says, you're not to commit adultery. When he says that you're not to steal. When he says you're not to lie. When he says you're to honor your father and mother. When he says you're to put me above everything. You're, to, you're, you're not to take my name in vain. Has he changed his mind on those things? No, not at all. And that's called um, the moral law. You have these codes all through the Old Testament that are pointing towards certain things. And many times it's talking about issues that are, are specific to those things. So, for example, in ancient Israel, if you stole from somebody, um, the, the law goes on and talks about you're not to steal. If you do steal, pay back double. Has God changed his mind on that? Yeah. Sometimes pay, pay back four times. Sometimes pay back seven times. These are good things for children. No joke. You know, I can't remember if my ch children ever stole. Did they ever steal anything? I don't remember if they stole anything. But if they had stolen, I could tell you for sure they paid back double. Because that'll tweak you. <laughs> that'll torque your gourd, make you never want to steal again. That kind of thing. And so I'm not saying that we need, we need to keep that law um, as uh, the United States of America uh, because we are not ancient Israel. But if they took and put that law in place instead of sticking somebody in jail for five to ten years, if they had to pay back double everything that they ever stole, you wouldn't have to have jails. You just have work camps where these guys go out and work and all their pay goes back to pay back the people that they ripped off. That's way better than a, than a prison. And that's basically what they had with uh, the Jews in the Old Testament. So there's some cool stuff in the Old Testament. Jesus said, uh, talked about the commands and he said, if you teach men to break these, then you're going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. Because I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. And so again, when I look at the Old Testament, it's, a, it's, it's not a matter of I just dismiss it. Um, there's reasons that God said certain things, and those reasons haven't changed. God's heart has not changed towards these things. Now, as far as me keeping it, I'm not going to be able to keep it by doing Old Testament commands. The way that I keep it is through the power of the Spirit. And so, haven't murdered anybody. Been a long time since, you know, I stole. Been a long time since I lied. Been a long time. You know, and you go, go down through the list. Been a long time. You know, so, some of the stuff, it's, you know, it happens so quick that you're like, ah! Thou shalt not covet. You look at somebody's stuff, and you're like, oh, I wish I had that, and they didn't. You know, that kind of thing. And then God goes, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, yeah, Lord. Please forgive me, and please bless them and their little thing that they have that I wish that they didn't and that I wish that I had. You know, that kind of stuff. But you know what I mean. It needs to be a work of the spirit. And one of the things that these people wanted to do was bring these guys into bondage. Whenever you go back to keeping the rules, keeping the law, trying to do things by performance, being performance oriented in the, in the sense of I'm not going to um, be able to, to uh, be blessed by God. I'm not gonna, well, I'm not blessed by God, but I'm not, God's not going to love me unless I do everything that he wants me to. That is not how we do this. The reason that um, I have a changed life 
is because God set his love on me. The reason that I have a changed life is because God looked down through the ages and he saw me and he picked me. And I don't think he should have. That's the reason I have a changed life. We love him because he first loved us. And so everything that we do, we do out of, uh, out of gratitude towards the Lord. In those areas where we're struggling, we know what God desires. We know what, what um, is pleasing to him. And in those areas where we're struggling, we come to Jesus and we say, Lord, if you don't change me, I'm always going to be the same. You need to make me something new. Please give me the same heart that you have towards these things and have towards the things of you. I want to hate what you hate. I want to love what you love. I want to be like you, Jesus. And that's how you change. You know, God, give me the power to do it. So I just looked at the clock. We're going to end it right there. But just again, remember, you have people who want to come along and they want to bring you into bondage and you're not to go there. You're to keep it the way it's always been from the time that you first knew Jesus, in love with Jesus, doing the things that God's called you to, not because um, you feel obligated in the, in the sense of, I got to impress God or something, but because it's an act of love towards the one who loved you first. You keep it like that and everything's going to be awesome. And if you get off on, on that whole thing, then everything becomes a works trip and it's just drudgery, bondage, as he says. So let me pray for you. We'll get you out of here. And again, Jesus, thank you, um, Lord, for the, um, like your word says, the glorious liberty that you brought us into. Thank you, Lord, um, that um, we're, we're not trying to perform for you. Um, we, we just have a heart towards you that's a heart of love. And God, if in any of these things um, we fall short, um, we just pray, pray that you remind us, that you, are, you get, us, get our heads in the right place, and that our focus would be on our love for you instead of our performance. Um, Father, I pray that you bless these people, that you would go before them now, uh, that they would be filled with your spirit, and that um, you would give them exceedingly abundantly above everything that they could ask or think uh, because of your love for them and your grace in Christ Jesus. And we ask this in your name. Amen. God bless you.